Hello and welcome back to Biology for Beginners. As always, I'm your host, Morgan. This week, we're going to be talking about the control of gene expression, part two. As always, right now, you'll be seeing the terms and definition slides popping up so that you can pause and grab the vocabulary that we will be using in this discussion. Now, a quick reminder, if you do want the PDF of my entire slideshow, please follow the link over to my Patreon page where you can grab that for absolutely free. But if you do decide you like the things that I'm doing here on the channel and you would like to support it, all patrons get early access to the bio for beginners content and hopefully future content here soon, at least a day in advance. But we're working that, we're workshopping it, finishing up college at the moment. So eyes on the future. Now let's get into this. Part one of the control of gene expression was all about the kind of early stage regulation. Well, today we're gonna to be talking about regulation at later stages. And the first thing that we need to talk about is the breakdown of mRNA. Now in prokaryotic organisms, so little single cell organisms like bacteria, the mRNA tends to be very short lived possibly even only minutes. So that mRNA will exist only as long as it needs for the protein to be made and then it gets broken down. That may only be a couple minutes. But if you start looking at the eukaryotic organisms, the mRNA may hang around for a bit longer. So for example, in red blood cells, the mRNA for hemoglobin, which is the thing that actually holds on to the oxygen, red blood cells transport oxygen all over your body. Well, this mRNA can last the entire length of that red blood cell's life, so around a month. Here we're seeing that mRNA, while it does get broken down, the time in which it's going to hang out in the cell is going to be dependent upon what it needs to be translated into what the actual gene that's being expressed is. So it can be very, very short lived or it can be very long lived. So minutes to a month and anything in between. And again, life is messy and things aren't always going to adhere to these general rules. So one thing here is that initiation of translation can also be controlled by proteins. So there are these things called global regulators that will control the translation of all of the little mRNAs. And there are also specific regulatory proteins that will trigger the start of the translation of specific mRNA proteins. And that's one way that any mRNAs that are hanging out will or won't get translated at different times. So it's not necessarily a bad thing if they are gonna be long lived like the mRNA for hemoglobin, they're not just going to constantly be getting translated. And another later stage regulation is Sometimes those polypeptides that are created need to be processed more. So the mRNA in question, while it produces a polypeptide in this sort of form that that polypeptide is made, it's not usable. There still needs a little bit more processing for that polypeptide to become active and for the function to be carried out. So one awesome example of this is actually insulin. When insulin is initially made, it's made in a form that's inactive. And this inactive form must go through a process known as cleavage. So it needs to be cut up a bit, different bonds need to be formed, and then you end up with the active form of insulin that can then process the sugars and all of that fun stuff that insulin is needed for. And that's just another regulation at the later stages. So the first protein's made, but it still needs to be processed a little bit before it can actually be usable. So a quick recap of this 
whole little slide here. The mRNA can either be short-lived or it can be longer-lived. And the translation of mRNAs is entirely controlled by proteins for the most part. The global regulators control all mRNAs, but there are specific proteins for specific mRNAs as well. And then sometimes the polypeptide that's made needs a little bit more processing before it's actually active. At this point, we might be asking the question, what about non-coding RNA? If you remember back from previous discussions, there are segments of RNA that are removed that are considered non-coding. So let's address this question. Only about 1.5% of the human genome actually codes for proteins. And then another small percent of DNA carries genes for things like ribosomal RNA and transfer RNA. So what about the rest of our DNA? That is a massive portion here that on the surface before you dig into it, looks like it does absolutely nothing. So why is it there? Now, originally, this DNA was thought to be untranscribed and lack any genetic information, and it was deemed junk DNA. Now, what we actually know is that a significant amount of it is actually going to be transcribed into non-protein coding RNAs. So these RNAs have pretty specific names, and they kind of, for the most part, do very similar things things. The first one we're going to talk about is microRNA or miRNA. And what microRNAs are is they're these very small strands of RNA. They're approximately about 22 nucleotides long, so very, very tiny. And their function is to form a complex with proteins where they can bind to mRNA with at least seven to eight nucleotides of a complementary sequence. So again, microRNAs are teeny tiny portions of RNA that are about 22 nucleotides long. They bind with a protein and then they can bind to mRNAs as long as there are seven to eight nucleotides of a complementary sequence. And Depending on how much of that mRNA binds to that microRNA, there will be a specific outcome. So if the mRNA is complementary to the entire length of that micro mRNA, it'll be broken down. So that mRNA binds to the whole microRNA that triggers the breakdown of that mRNA. However, if the mRNA binds to only a part of that microRNA, translation is blocked. So the mRNA will not be broken down, but it also won't be translated. So what about the other types of non-coding RNA? What do they do? Well, there's a thing called small interfering RNA or siRNA that's very similar to size and function of microRNA and they're so similar, in fact, that this book actually has the same definition. If you notice on my terms and definition slides, microRNA and small interfering RNA have the exact same definition. That's not an accident. That's actually in the book that I'm using. They are basically the same thing function-wise, and honestly, I don't study this specific thing in biology, so I cannot tell you myself what the actual difference between them is, and this book doesn't go into it, and most entry-level classes, honestly, might even skip this entire section altogether. Um, most of the entry-level bio classes I have taken have actually skipped a lot of this stuff, so you may or may not need to know the difference depending on what biology class you're taking. But the big deal here would be remembering the microRNA binds to a protein, and if the mRNA is able to bind to the entire sequence of the nucleotides, it'll be broken down. 
but if it only binds to a portion of the nucleotides, translation is blocked. That would be the big deal to remember here, since microRNA and small interfering RNA are so similar, chances are your general entry level class that's probably for non-majors is just going to have you know the microRNA term. So the other thing we need to understand here is a thing known as RNA interference. And RNA interference is specifically the control of gene expression by the siRNA, so the small interfering RNAs. And this is what researchers actually use to artificially control gene expression. And that's something that's really interesting to get into if you are interested in how researchers kind of turn genes off and on and do that stuff. We're not going to get into that here because that's a little advanced for this video, but if that is something you're interested in, you're going to want to look into those small interfering RNA and that's one of the things that you're going to want to start your search at. But let's move on to a little bit about animal development. So the animal in question that we're going to be looking at right now is the fruit fly. You'll notice we're going to talk about fruit flies a lot because they are a model organism that has given us a lot of the research and understanding into evolution and development that we have now. So the big deal about fruit flies in this particular case is that they gave us the first glimpse into the relationship between embryonic development and gene expression. So the big question here is how does one fertilized egg cell result in a complex organism? Because again, it took one cell, well, technically two cells, egg and sperm cell, but one fertilized egg is what we're looking at. And it results in such a complex organism with cells all over the place carrying out different functions. So how the heck does that happen? Well, to answer this question, we need to begin our discussion prior to fertilization. So the first thing that we see is that there's going to be signaling between that unfertilized egg cell and the follicle cells around it. And this is going to set off a cascade of gene expression. So depending on these chemical signals, different genes are going to be expressed in different areas. So as these genes are expressed, we see growth of the egg cell, we see production and localization of head mRNA, so the mRNAs that are going to make up the head side of the eventual organism. And that, again, just determines where the head will develop. And then we get fertilization. And after this fertilization, we get expression of things known as homeotic genes. And homeotic genes are basically the master control genes that regulate the body anatomy. So they basically tell these different cells that you're going to become an eye cell. And we get more cascades of gene expression being controlled by the homeotic genes. You see different regions of this embryo start to develop into the different regions of a fully developed fruit fly. So here we go from one egg cell and through these different gene regulatory processes, we get the eventually the adult fly from one single cell. And it is a little more complex than that. But the big deal is to know that it's all through these signals. It's all through what genes are being expressed where. And these homeotic genes that control how the other genes are going to be expressed and control the anatomy of that body. So how can researchers actually monitor gene expression? How do we know where different genes are 
actually being expressed versus where they're not, where they're switched on, where they're switched off. Well, the general ways that researchers are going to do this are through nucleic acid hybridization and by doing DNA microarrays. On the slide, you can see examples of each. We're not going to go very in depth into these, but the important thing is to know that these are the tools that researchers use to kind of see what the heck is happening as far as gene expression goes. So in the nucleic acid hybridization, we can see that a probe will hybridize with a specific mRNA, and then that allows the researchers to actually see specifically where that gene is being expressed. And then in the DNA microarray, it's literally just a bunch of wells that contain copies of DNA fragments carrying a specific gene. And based on the colors and how they're showing up, it'll tell them where genes are being expressed and all of that stuff. Again, we can go more in depth in it, but I don't know how relevant that would necessarily be for an intro level class. But if you would like more on this, please let me know in the comments and I will do a video on these. But for a very basic intro level class, chances are you're not going to go in depth in these. So that's why I'm not going to go in depth in these here. But I have left you this slide in case you're interested to look over. So how exactly do cells know what they need to make? How does something go from a cellular message to a specific response? Well, the way this occurs is through something known as the signal transduction pathway. And basically what happens is that a signaling cell is going to secrete a signaling molecule. Now the signaling molecule will travel all the way to the target cell or it will bind to a very specific receptor protein in the plasma membrane of that target cell. The signaling cell may or may not be close to the target cell and different signaling pathways will be shorter or longer depending on where the signal originated and where the target is. But the basics of this process are always going to be for the most part, fairly similar. So once that target cell has received the signal in that receptor protein, a relay is going to be triggered. And that's convenient because the relay is carried out by things known as relay proteins or relay molecules, because they may or may not actually be proteins, depending on what cell and all that jazz. So these Relay proteins will be activated within the cell one at a time, sending that signal all the way to the nucleus. And this is the signal transduction pathway because that signal is being relayed from one protein to another. And that very last relay protein will activate what is known as a transcription factor and the transcription factor will end up transcribing a very specific gene and the mRNA that is resultant from that transcription will end up being translated and the necessary protein to perform the function that was called for by the original signal will then be synthesized and the target cell will have made the appropriate protein to carry out the appropriate gene expression and the appropriate response called for. So signaling cell sends out that signaling molecule, signaling molecule binds to the receptor protein, relay proteins carry that message down that signal transduction pathway, the transcription factor is activated inside the nucleus, the DNA will be transcribed, that mRNA 
will then end up being translated in the cytoplasm and then the new protein will be synthesized and that whole thing from the original message to the desired response will have been completed and you will have gotten the response necessary. No matter how long that pathway needs to be, it's going to be more or less the same. So it doesn't matter how far away that initial signal is, you're going to just carry out a bunch of signals so the target cell is able to make the protein that will then make sure the appropriate response happens. And it's pretty simple. If you just remember these steps, you should be all right. And before we wrap up here, we need to recognize that this whole cell signaling thing is actually fairly ancient. And there's evidence that cell signaling is ancient from single cell organisms. Now, in single cell organisms, you're not getting signals from one part of the body to another because there is no real body, so to speak of, it's a single cell organism. And the organism we're gonna look at real quickly here that has given us this evidence is yeast. So the organism responsible for our bread rising and for beer. And the very quick explanation here with this little diagram, we see we have two different yeast cells that are two different mating types. A and alpha. Now the two cells will send signals or factors to each other. Those signals will bind to receptors and then the end result will be that these cells will fuse. And because of this signaling between the two yeast cells, that's the evidence that we have that cell signaling is ancient and didn't first pop up in multicellular organisms. Signaling between cells goes back to our single cellular roots in the whole biological world. But that's more of a fun fact, and most entry-level classes just want you to know how the signal transduction pathway works. Know that the signal will originate in a signaling cell, and then a bunch of proteins will relay that message into the target cell and you'll get a very specific protein depending on what the signal molecule was. So that's all I have for you this week. I hope you have a wonderful rest of your day, afternoon, evening, what have you, and I will see you all in the next one. Thank you again for watching this video. Don't forget to like, comment, subscribe, and ring that bell if you would like to see more. And if you'd like to follow me on any of my other social medias, the links are down in the description below. Don't forget to check out thereptilegoth.com for all of my articles and blog posts. If you found any value in this video and you would like to help support the channel, please check out my Patreon page. That link is also in the description down below. And a special thanks goes out to my Diamond Dragon patron, Diane V. What you're doing is really helping me fund a dream here. I will see you guys all in the next one.